What's going on, smart people? Bringing you the final episode of Tensor Calculus for Physics based on the book Tensor Calculus for Physics. I will leave a link in the description. I put quotations on final because I love Tensor Calculus. I'm going to make more videos on it in the future, but this is a nice spot to wrap things up with. Uh, the goal of this video is to arrive at Einstein's field equations. It's not going to be a formal derivation per se, um, but we are going to be able to make a series of arguments and arrive at it, and I think it'll be pretty satisfying. Maybe in a future video I'll do it more formally by varying the Einstein-Hilbert action or something like that. Uh, in a previous video, I think I was a little bit overly optimistic thinking I could cover both Einstein's field equations and have a discussion on the interpretations of the different curvature tensors all in one video. I'm going to save that curvature tensor stuff for a one-off video. I have made a video on the Riemann curvature tensor, but not really assigning interpretations to what they mean, what the Riemann curvature tensor means, what the Ricci tensor means, and the Ricci scalar. What do these three different curvatures really mean? So I'm going to save that for like a one-off video in the future. Um, but yeah, today is all on Einstein's field equations. If you'd like to catch up on some of the important uh, videos that have led us to this, to be able to tackle it in a kind of simple manner, I'll leave links in the description, namely to the ones where I describe the Riemann curvature tensor and the Bianchi identities, and also how we can relate the metric tensor to uh, the gravitational potential in, in the Newtonian limit. That's the stuff we're gonna be pulling from for this video to make it go a little bit faster. Okay, now in one of those videos, we showed that in this Newtonian limit, we had that the, uh, let me change this color, we had that the Laplacian of the metric tensor in the Newtonian limit was equal to eight pi g times the mass density. And, um, the relativistic generalization of this mass energy density is all encoded in the energy momentum tensor. Uh, so that is defined, so this could be also expressed in like a pseudo tensor form as, I shouldn't call it pseudo tensor because that's actually a thing, in this almost tensor form as uh, 8 pi g t zero zero in the Newtonian limit where t is the energy momentum tensor. And throughout this video c is equal to one just so I'm not tracing down uh, factors of C throughout everything. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the energy momentum tensor, it encodes all of the information of, you guessed it, energy, momentum, uh, pressure, grad school, which is shear stress, all of that stuff is in here. So the zero, zero component is effectively the Hamiltonian density. It's like the energy density. We also have the T zero I components, which is the momentum density. Um, oops. I'll do that. The momentum density. We can take the diagonal I terms, so TII, which is the pressure. I know I'm using P for both, but we're not going to be actually using the energy momentum tensor, so just bear with me on that. And then also we have the off diagonal components, I not equal to J, which is the shear stress uh, typically denoted with a tau. So all that stuff contributes to the total energy and mass density and all that stuff of the system. And it's what's necessary to fully describe how the geometry of space changes. Okay. Um, so with just this right off the bat, we can tell that we're looking at something like a second rank tensor equation. So the goal is to generalize Poisson's equation to be fully relativistic. Uh, and the way that we're going to start that off is by guessing that that generalization is going to be a second rank tensor equation. So I'm going to say we're going to posit that the equations of motion will be some second rank tensor equation G, t mu nu, where t mu nu is now the full, it's not Newtonian limit, it's the, the full energy momentum tensor, and g mu nu is to be determined. In a, I think the Bianchi identity video I did, we actually did define what g mu nu is. We're gonna pretend like we don't already know. We're gonna figure out what it needs to be. Okay, so we're gonna posit that this is gonna be our field equations and we're going to look at a series of criteria to narrow down what g mu nu could possibly be. So let's go ahead and do that, or the criteria. Criteria for g mu nu and also just in general the criteria for the Einstein field equations. 
What does this stuff need to satisfy? Well, first and foremost, as you can tell, it's a second rank tensor equation, and I'm going to put a little asterisk there because it's easy to see, I shouldn't say it's easy to see, from what it needs to reduce to, we can identify it with something like a second rank tensor equation, but maybe that's just a simplification. Maybe that's a special case or something, but I'll talk about that more in just a, a few minutes. But this does look like a second rank tensor, asterisk. Uh, what else? So it needs to be, if we look at Poisson's equation, so I'm going to write it up here just so that we have something to reference. Poisson's equation, del squared of the gravitational potential is equal to 4 pi g rho. And in the static weak field limit that we used in the previous video, we were able to identify, uh, so g mu nu was equal to the constant Minkowski metric plus a static kind of like a perturbation, h mu nu, where h mu nu, h zero zero, I should say, was eventually identified with two phi. So that's why in our uh, simple case, we have an eight pi here, because we're effectively taking the Laplacian squared of two times the potential. So it's eight pi instead of four pi. Okay. So if we look at Poisson's equation, Poisson's equation is linear in second derivatives of the gravitational field, or linear in second derivatives of the metric. So that's a property we would like our field equations to inherit as well. So we like to think that it will be linear in second derivatives of g mu nu. So that means we could form combinations of like d mu, d nu, g alpha beta, um, d mu, d alpha, g beta nu, uh, etc. Now this is a second rank tensor equation, so in these combinations we'd have to form contractions so that we're left with a two index object, and we'd also have to add certain terms to it to make sure the end result is in fact a tensor, because if you just take derivatives, we know that the derivative of a tensor in general is not going to be a tensor. Um, so that's something to consider. So we have these linear and second derivatives of the metric. Uh, we also want to keep it simple. We want to keep it simple, stupid. We don't want this to be any more complicated than it needs to be. If nature presents itself in a more complicated manner, then yeah, we could add more corrections to it. In fact, that's people's careers, is modifying, trying to modify Einstein's field equations for higher order contractions of the Riemann tensor and its covariant derivatives and the Weyl tensor. Um, but for this, we're just not going to include it. If you think of all of that higher order stuff as being multiplied by a number, we're just going to assume that number is either really, really small or zero for this video. I'm not an expert on GR though, so I don't want to ruffle any feathers for the people who, uh, I, I don't know what I'm talking about for how do we introduce these higher order terms? That's, that's not this video. Um, Okay, so we want to keep it simple. What else do we need? We also would like it to, it needs to satisfy some form of local energy momentum conservation, right? So local EMT conservation. EMT is the energy momentum tensor. Mathematically, this can be phrased in, the, in terms of uh, the energy momentum tensor being divergenceless. The fact that this is local, you should be a little bit more careful with conservation laws and uh, divergence lists and making the connection between the two, but in any case, so the reason I say conservation leads to divergence lists is because say that we were taking the divergence of the energy momentum tensor, that would be equal to D zero, uh, T zero, and let's set new equal to zero as well, plus D I, T i zero. Well, the zero zero component of the energy momentum tensor is like the energy, the energy density, and the zero derivative is something like a time derivative. So we get like a dt of an energy, and the i zero term is like the momentum density, and we get the minus sign from the metric. Forget about gr. Let's just gain some intuition with why this stuff means conservation. Uh, so it's going to be minus like a divergence of this momentum, and that should be equal to zero, is what I'm saying. 
this is just the continuity equation. So it's a statement of conservation of energy and momentum, or if we took new equal to other things, so we have four continuity equations. That's all that I'm saying with local energy momentum tensor conservation. But if we're assuming left-hand side equals right-hand side, that means that g mu nu also needs to be divergenceless. So the divergence of g mu nu has to equal zero as well. And oftentimes, so the metric tensor is a symmetric tensor. Um, so that means it should have 10 independent components. But this requirement here actually helps us reduce it to six. Because if you think about it, we have a d zero, say g zero zero, uh, or g zero nu is equal to uh, d i g i nu. We're saying this tensor here is going to be in terms of second derivatives of the metric. Okay, here we have a spatial derivative of g, which means the right hand side. I mean, the spatial derivative is not a time derivative, so that means g i nu is a second derivative of the metric. And here we're taking a time derivative of g zero nu, but if this is supposed to be a second derivative of the metric, that means that g zero nu must only be a first derivative instead of a second derivative. In other words, we don't get any dynamics of the metric from these equations. There are more so constraints on the coordinates. So there's four equations there, which is why a lot of times you'll hear that uh, really there's six independent um, components of the metric tensor if you think about think about it this way. That's what I need. Okay. And then the final the final criteria is it needs to reduce to Poisson's equation, right? It needs to reduce to del squared phi equals four pi g row that's what we're that's what we're trying to generalize so of course it should reduce to it in a special case all right so now we are free to ask ourselves what could g mu nu possibly be in terms of what could g mu nu be in terms of before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit more. Uh, I guess I'll save it for a little bit later. Well, we need second derivatives of the metric, and we need these combinations. And first derivatives could be fine as well, because in this local inertial frame, non-relativistic limit, we can transform away uh, Christoffel symbols, which are first derivatives of the metric. So we could also contain those. Um, so we need tensors that are built from second derivatives of the metric. Well, we know one that's a fourth rank tensor. We know the Riemann curvature tensor. And an interesting property about it, I'll leave a link in the description to a proof of this, is that the Riemann curvature tensor is unique. Meaning if you say, I want a fourth rank tensor linear in first and second derivatives of the metric, and you succeed in finding one, you can show that it is equivalent to the Riemann curvature tensor. So you could go through a shitload of algebra uh, linearly combining these first and second derivatives of the metric and see what correction terms you have to add in order for everything to transform as a tensor at the end. Or we can go ahead and try to construct these tensors from the Riemann curvature tensor itself. And luckily, we already did that heavy lifting. We know what those objects are because we have the, Re the Ricci tensor, r mu nu, which is in our sign convention, uh, r lambda mu lambda nu. Uh, as we'll find out, sign conventions are incredibly important once we end up trying to get these coefficients of what the equations could possibly be in terms of, So, um, but we'll get to that. So we have the Ricci tensor, and we also have the Ricci scalar. Now the Ricci scalar is not a second rank tensor, but you know what it is? The Ricci tensor times the metric, g mu nu. Uh, we can also add terms that vanish in the limit that we go to non-relativistic, or rather uh, the Newtonian limit that just vanish. And as long as it's divergenceless, we could add those terms as well. So we could add some constant times the metric that's not the Ricci uh, scalar. Uh, so this is what we would include if we wanted to add a cosmological constant term. We're keeping it simple, stupid. We're not including this guy for this. 
But yeah, it turns out if you were to go through adding all of this stuff up and adding your terms and saying, I want the end result to be a tensor, these would be, these would end up being your options. These are not the only second rank tensors that you can build. Um, like we could also take Ricci tensors to certain powers and, and things like that. But uh, for keeping it simple, stupid, this is, this is all we have. So we can actually guess the form of the Einstein field equations and it'll be something like some constant times the Ricci tensor plus some other constant times the Ricci scalar times the metric and that's going to be equal to 8 pi g t mu nu. These are our options. The rest is the an amount of, uh, the rest amounts to finding what these coefficients need to be. And that's what the rest of this video is going to be. Okay. Uh, the first thing that we can do to try to, um, actually, let me talk about the, the Riemann curvature tensor a little bit more. Personally, when I learned this stuff, I was very dissatisfied that it's the Ricci tensor for some reason that shows up in Einstein's field equations explicitly, rather than the Riemann curvature tensor that literally is the intrinsic curvature of subspaces of vectors scaled it means the intrin if that thing is flat space is flat if it's not there's some curvature going on so my mind was uh i wasn't satisfied knowing that the riemann curvature tensor wasn't explicitly in the field equations and one reason i mean generalizing poisson's equation into into uh where is it, into this guy, where it looks like a second rank tensor equation, that may be satisfying to you. But also, if you wanted to try to formulate field equations in the in terms of the Riemann curvature tensor, say, well, why can't, why can't it be one? Uh, well, one thing that you could try is you could try setting the Riemann curvature tensor, let's say mu, alpha, beta, nu, equal to some properly anti-symmetric combination of energy momentum tensors, mu, alpha, uh, beta nu plus whatever needs to be added in order for the stuff to be anti-symmetric about the indices and whatnot. Well, you could, you could look at the vacuum solutions to this, where the energy momentum tensor is zero, so the vacuum solution. Shit. And what that tells you is if the right-hand side is equal to zero, that would tell you that R mu alpha beta nu is equal to zero. So that means there's no mass there, then there's no curvature. Now, initially that may sound like it makes sense, but if you have a planet orbiting a star, you know, outside of the star where there may not be any mass that the planet is orbiting through, space is still curved there. So there not being mass there doesn't mean that there's no curvature. Okay, so something like this just wouldn't wouldn't work for the vacuum solutions. And there's other things like the Riemann curvature tensor contains more information than the Ricci tensor that just isn't needed to uniquely determine the metric. Uh, things like deformations, not changing volumes when you parallel transport vectors. I'll talk about all that stuff once I make an additional video on what these objects mean, Riemann, Ricci, and Ricci scalar. But for now, I hope that's at least a little bit satisfying. So this is going to be our template. This is what we're going to try to find the coefficients for. And if we successfully do that, then cool. If, does it agree with experiment? Yeah, awesome. Then these must be right, or at least the corrections must be very small. So the way that we're going to find these coefficients first is we're going to go ahead and use uh, this criteria here first, local energy momentum tensor conservation. We're going to take the divergence of both sides. It may sound... <laughs> Horrible, but it's it's simple because we did the heavy lifting already when we did the contracted by Bianchi identity video. So if we take the divergence of both sides, let's do d mu a r. Ah, uh, let's just already apply it. Why not? So we have a d mu r mu nu plus b g mu nu d mu r. Andrew, why did you pull the covariant derivative through the metric? Well, because the covariant derivative commutes with the metric because uh, the Christoffel connection is metric compatible. That's how we define the covariant derivative. And that's how we can like raise and lower indices uh, through this stuff. Okay, and that should be equal to zero because the divergence of the energy momentum tensor is zero. And from the contracted Bianchi identities, we already know 
we know that d mu r mu nu is equal to one half, uh, it's gonna be a g mu nu d mu r. So this follows from the contracted Bianchi identity, which we did in the last video. Hell yeah, let's substitute this in. Um, so we have a, well we have one half a, uh, g mu nu, d mu r, plus b, g mu nu, d mu r, equals zero. If we factor that stuff out, we get g mu nu, d mu r, times stuff on the inside, one half a, plus b equals zero. Okay, we can have the trivial solution such that uh, this guy is zero, or we can have a or b is equal to minus one half a. Okay, so we've already narrowed it down to one unknown variable, which is a. And that may seem like, oh wow, we're almost there. No, finding A takes a lot more work. To give you a bit of a spoiler, we're gonna spend probably 10, 15 minutes finding out that A is one, or the magnitude of A is one. Let's go ahead and do it. <laughs> uh, so let's substitute this in first. So we have A, and, and factor out the A, uh, R mu nu minus one half G mu nu R is equal to eight pi g t mu nu. All right, uh, so now it's a matter of finding out what a is, so finding a. So in the interest of not having you watch me uh, write down expressions for two minutes, I, all I've done is I've copied and pasted from previous video the definition of the Riemann curvature tensor, and then set lambda equal to nu which allowed us to uh, express the Ricci tensor, and this stuff is in Riemann normal coordinates. So in order to find out what A is, we're gonna take a look at the static weak field limit. We're gonna be investigating what the stuff needs to reduce to. And in that limit, we're gonna be looking at Riemann normal coordinates to uh, simplify our expressions a bit. So all we have is the Riemann tensor, which I've used to contract one of the indices and obtain the Ricci tensor in this coordinate system. And then we have the standard definition of the Christoffel symbols. In the static weak field limit, the metric tensor is just Minkowski plus some small perturbation that depends on x. Static means the h doesn't depend on time. Okay, so we know the stuff once we go to the weak field limit should be in terms of zero, zero components of the metric. So let's go ahead and look at r0, zero. zero. So r0, zero, zero would then be uh, well, if we look at this guy, we have nu is zero, so that's a time derivative. But we're taking the time derivative of the Christoffel symbols, and the Christoffel symbols are in terms of just the metric and its derivatives. But if the metric is static, then the time derivative is just zero. So we don't actually, this term is actually just zero. So we get this is equal to minus d lambda gamma lambda zero zero and we're summing over lambda, but yet again, the lambda equal to zero term vanishes because that's a time derivative. So this is just equal to minus di gamma i zero zero. Okay, now let's take a look at what this Christoffel symbol actually is. Gamma i zero zero is equal to one half g lambda beta, or no, I guess it's gonna be i beta. Uh, again, in these terms, we're gonna mu and nu are equal to zero, so these are time derivatives of the metric which vanish. So we're only left with minus d beta g zero zero. Um, and I should probably put Newtonian on here. We're looking at Newtonian limits. And then we contract, uh, actually we can just keep it like that. I guess we can raise the index, why not? So this is equal to 
oops, there's a minus sign there, minus one half di g zero zero Newtonian limit. All right, so then the Ricci tensor zero zero component r zero zero is just minus di of minus one half di g n zero zero. Now, if we want to compare this to the usual Laplacian, we should convert this to the lower index, and we're still summing over i, and numerically that's just multiplying that term by minus one, right? If we compare the, if we're using the uh, mostly minus metric signature, then when we lower this guy, it just gets a, it's just the negative of its covariant counterpart, I should say. So we can write this as one half the Laplacian of G zero zero Newtonian limit and so yeah so we had two minus cancels and then we get another minus sign from lowering this guy uh and then we know that the metric g zero zero newtonian is equal to minkowski zero zero plus h zero zero which is equal to uh one plus two phi so when we take the laplacian we're just getting we're just showing that r zero zero is equal to, uh, and there should be a minus sign here, sorry about that, uh, R00 should equal the Laplacian minus the Laplacian of phi. Yeah, I explained why we needed a minus sign that I didn't actually write the minus sign here. So yeah, this has a minus sign. Cool. So we got that for the Ricci tensor. Now let's do a similar thing with the Ricci scalar. So the Ricci scalar R is just the contraction of R alpha, R alpha, which is just going to be uh, R zero, zero, um, minus R I, I, right? If we say, you can do this by just saying, like R is equal to uh, G, alpha, beta, r, alpha, beta, and then you get the minus sign from the metric tensor for the spatial components. Okay, um, so if we want to compare this guy to its doubly covariant counterpart, again we just get, uh, well actually nothing changes because the time-like component of the metric is positive. So we get r is equal to r, zero, zero, minus r i i and now we just got to take it home so in this newtonian limit the metric tensor is really just the mass density the other components of the metric tensor are just going to be zero okay but if the other components so that's the t i j components are going to be zero in other words t zero zero the magnitude is much more much larger than the tij components. But if the tij components are small, then that means that these terms must be, for mu nu equal to ij, that these terms must be really close to zero, right? So that means rij must be really close to one half gijr in this limit. So under that assumption, so assume R i j is approximately equal to one half uh, g i j r, and g i j is just minus one, right? All of those. Well, I guess let's not do that just yet. Then we can go ahead and take the trace of both sides. This would be an i. R i i is then one half g i i. R, and these spatial components have the minus sign. So when we take the trace, this is just equal to minus three halves R. So now we know what RII is. So R is equal to R zero zero plus uh, three halves R. 
Okay. Now, if we move R to the other side, that lets us relate the zero, zero component of the Ricci tensor to the Ricci scalar. Namely, we get R is equal to minus two R zero, zero. Okay. So if we substitute that into our equation, so we have A R zero, zero minus one half uh, G zero, zero R is equal to eight pi g t zero zero. Then substituting r zero zero, just writing it again, r zero zero is equal to minus the Laplacian of the gravitational potential. And then we have this guy here as well. So we have a times uh, minus Laplacian of the gravitational potential minus one half g zero zero is one and r is minus two r zero minus two times minus the Laplacian of the gravitational potential. All right, so we have a minus del squared phi. And now we have three minus signs. Uh, so it's gonna give us a minus del squared phi, which is equal to minus two a del squared phi which is equal to eight pi g, I'm just gonna go ahead and write t zero zero as rho. Okay, and this is exactly Laplace's equation. Uh, so we have a times del squared phi is equal to minus four pi g rho, which tells us that a is equal to minus one. Now the sign, the magnitude of A does not depend on the sign conventions that you've used, that we've used throughout the series, but the sign of A does matter. Uh, the fact that we're using the mostly minus metric signature as opposed to the primarily positive, you could probably also get different signs if you use instead of uh, R mu nu equaling R lambda mu lambda nu, if instead of this we contracted it with the final index that would be equivalent up to a minus sign. So all of these things can contribute into the sign of A. So the one that we've derived is uh, using all of these sign conventions that have propagated throughout the series. That's actually not the standard to my understanding of the sign conventions that are typically used. So more often than not, uh, if you use say the primarily positive metric signature and maybe the other convention for the reach for the Riemann tensor, or maybe that actually cancels out, you'll get that A equals one. So the standard gives A equals positive one. Okay. So we've done using our metric signature, nothing is wrong. We would calculate exactly the same observables, but just for the sake of writing it in the form that you've probably seen it before, let's go ahead and use A equals one which gives that our Einstein field equations read r mu nu minus one half r g mu nu is equal to eight pi g t mu nu. And these are Einstein's field equations. And what this says is if you put a really massive object like your mama in space, then we can calculate directly how the geometry of space changes. And I've been waiting three years to tell that joke. <laughs> this has been a long series, but it, it, we are finally at Einstein's field equations. So I know this wasn't the most formal thing ever. The difficulty of this video was not the tensor calc. And that's what's kind of amazing about this is if you follow through this lecture series, Nothing I've done in this video, as far as the tensor manipulation goes, is really all that crazy. Uh, the hard part was the assumptions that we're allowed to make and the static weak field limit. The physics was the hard part, go figure. Um, so that just goes to show, I mean, you follow the series and it's like, it's not that this is, was easy necessarily, but all we had to do was calculate coefficients. So uh, I guess that's all I really have to say. Now you understand that Matter tells space-time how to curve, and curve space-time tells matter how to move. 
in a future video, maybe I'd love to actually solve this guy for simple cases like the vacuum solution. I'm in no rush to do that though, but I really do appreciate all five of you sticking around through the lecture series. I hope you guys enjoyed the series. Let me know in the comment section if you did, and I'll see you guys there.